Hi, good evening, and welcome to the Kansas Legislature, our Friday evening call-in show dealing with politics and proceedings of the Kansas Legislature here on Smoky Hills Public Television. I'm your host, Jay Steinmetz, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Fort Hayes State University and Policy Fellow at the Docking Institute. We have a great show lined up for you tonight. As I mentioned, this is a call-in show. Uh, you can call in with your questions about politics, policy, anything happening in the Kansas Legislature uh, currently. Our number is 1-800-337-4788. Again, that number is 1-800-337-4788. We've got a great show lined up for you this evening, and uh, I want to welcome two representatives of the Kansas House of Representatives. First, we have Representative Ken Rogers of the 110th District, and we have also with us tonight Representative Russ Jennings of the 122nd District. Welcome, gentlemen, for another session, uh, another round of the Kansas Legislature here. It's good to see both of you. Um, it's been some time. A lot has happened since the last time we've sat down and discussed politics here. We had a major consequential election, presidential election, in November uh, 2020. We've had accusations of widespread fraud and, and illegalities. Um, we've had a, uh, a riot in the U.S. Capitol. Uh, we've had a lot uh, tested us over the past couple of months. And uh, the first question that I have for you is, you know, how important is it that our state elected officials publicly support the integrity of our electoral process? And in particular, this last election in November 2020, how important do you feel as an elected official that you speak to the public about the integrity, the fairness of our electoral process? And let's start with you, Representative Jennings. Sure. Well, I think we should start with Kansas. Uh, there's no indication whatsoever that there was any fraud or difficulty in the election process in Kansas. Um, we, tend to, we tend to think of our own things as going well, and sometimes it's the other guy. And I think that's part of what happened in this cycle. It's easy to point to other states or to other secretary of states and their processes and say that... <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, say that's broken. Uh, I think if all states just take the time to make sure they have solid policies, they're following their laws, uh, we can have faith in the system. And frankly, you know, I see no reason not to believe the outcomes of the elections are the true outcomes. Sure, we've had several recounts, we've had some audits, we've had <clears throat> over 60 court cases and judges looking at these issues. Um, and one of the benefits of the American electoral system is it's decentralized. The states really run their electoral processes. Um, uh, what do you think, uh, Representative Rogers, uh, how important is it that we speak to the public about the integrity and fairness of our electoral process? Well, I think it's a, one of the things we have to do. Um, you know, when we all were watching leading up to the election and post-election, uh, and we hear all the news, and guess what state wasn't mentioned of having problems? Kansas. I believe our Secretary of State, his staff, and others, and our county uh, clerks or county elected officials uh, did right. Um, it's, it's easy if eh, maybe things didn't turn out quite right to, to, to maybe question it. That wasn't in Kansas. It ran smooth. We did have a lot of people that voted early. We had a lot of people that voted absentee. But we also had folks show up. And even in the small community that I live in near Agra, uh, <coughs> When I go in there, absolutely they know who I am, but you know what? I showed my ID. I didn't get a pass. To me, that shows the integrity of the election in some of our smallest communities is just as strong as anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in other states and other situations, that's me as, a, as elected official in the state of Kansas. I, I, I didn't get involved and won't get involved in those other states. It is unfortunate that because of, of that and some of the situations leading up to it, that we have planted that seed of doubt. Is our system perfect? Absolutely not. But it's, it's, it's the best we have. It's the best in the world. We still have people clamoring to want to come to the U.S. So I would say that's still a, a check mark that, that, that we're doing okay. I point this out in my political <clears throat> science classes that our electoral process, the transparency and the fairness of it, uh, rivals uh, all the advanced Western democracies in the world. So we have a great system, um, but I'm concerned about the public's perception of it uh, and the role that, that elected officials have in, in speaking the truth about the outcome of an election, um, despite the fact that uh, who we want well, to win doesn't necessarily well, but win. Our, but our history shows that. As you know, as, as a uh, public policy, 
history government uh, instructor. You know that uh, we're still a great experiment. Mm -hmm. We're still young in, in the world. And every once in a while this happens. If we go back in history, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we maybe had some uprisings. Th this happens. I think what, what maybe has changed is we live in such an instant society, Instagram, TikTok, and I want that instant gratification. I, I need to know immediately. How many years ago did we spend time in our courthouses till late watching with the chalkboard, writing down the numbers? And now if we don't have instant updates every 10 minutes and no in like an hour after the election, well, then what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, people are still, the integrity is still there. And so I, I think, um, I would hope, and what I see by the numbers of people that came out and voted is they still believe in the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a, there may be a, a bit of a, of, a, of a hiccup, I would call it that, mm -hmm. but I believe next time we have an election with our local officials for, for school board and city, and then in two more years we have an election for governor and, and, and we'll be up for re-election and so on, people will be engaged, ready to vote. Largest number of voters in American election history, 150 million voters or so. Where do you see Representative Jennings uh, mail-in voting going? Uh, you know, would you like to see more states uh, uh, take the lead of, for example, Kansas? We've had, we have a mail-in <coughs> voting, don't need an excuse, postmark by election day, election ran smoothly. Um, do you see this process uh, uh, being utilized more frequently in future elections? You know, I think we look to states like Kansas where we've had it, we use it, it's accessible to people, it's, it's pretty open, it's an extended period of time. Uh, there's no suggestion in, that our process has had any fraud involved in it uh, that would impact the outcomes of elections. And access to the ability to vote is, is terribly important for people and, and we should give them that opportunity. As long as you can have assurance that the integrity exists and that we can trust the result. You know, part of the dialogue that's gone on this cycle was uh, this, this conspiracy thought and distrust of, of uh, processes in, in isolation, right? It was in key states. It wasn't a mistake that the focus was on a particular set of stakes, states because they were critical in determining outcomes. Uh, they weren't looking at, at, at Maine. Mm -hmm. They weren't looking at Kansas, because mm -hmm. it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were some states put under the microscope in a way that they never anticipated. Uh, were there some flaws in their processes, potentially? Are they going to fix them? You bet they will. And I think we'll see uh, more standardized, advanced balloting opportunities and mail-in ballots for folks. But integrity is, is key. You have to have that. Mm -hmm. And state-level control over the electoral <clears throat> process as well. State legislatures writing those laws that determine the election processes in those states. Um, any other words on that, Representative Rogers? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, th I think, you know, the, the final say on all the, the, the mail-in ballots is probably not done. I think there's going to be a lot of look into that. Personally, I like to vote on Election Day. Uh, I bounced. I didn't in November. I was gone that day when she was going to make it back in time. So the process worked smoothly. Um, but uh, that may be one that, that may take a second look. But... I think as we get to do a review of the whole COVID situation, uh, there's going to be a lot of things maybe that may be different than what what's, was successful, what wasn't, uh, and I think our elections are going to be one of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's shift gears and talk about the pandemic. Um, first of all, let's look back, you know, at at um, uh, the state response uh, to the to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, how well has Governor Laura Kelly uh, done? How well has the Kansas legislature done? in handling uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Grade the, the, the governor and grade the legislature. Let's start with you, Representative Jennings. Well, let's start with the legislature. The legislature's role is not to manage crisis, not to manage agencies, not to micromanage. The legislature's role is to appropriate and provide oversight. So we tend to be an after-the-fact organization in terms of that oversight. Uh, and, and we did something um, fairly extraordinary uh, because of the pressure of circumstance where we established a process of immediate partial legislative oversight through either the, well, initially the Legislative Coordinating Council, but ultimately the State Finance Council to review executive orders, for instance. Um, our Emergency Management Act was not written with a statewide 
uh, emergency pandemic in mind. It was written for tornadoes, for floods, for multi-county, but not statewide events. So we're, we're going to revisit that, uh, and, and I'm sure we'll come up with a structure that is different than what we had in February of last year when this started happening. In terms of the governor's response, um, I think she's done some things well. I think if she had some things to do over differently, she most certainly would. Uh, there were a, a misstep or two early on that I think uh, undermined perhaps some confidence in, in how she was approaching things, particularly the, the, the church business, right? Going to uh, order churches to be closed down. Um, while one might think, well, okay, maybe that makes sense. It's a congregate setting and shouldn't be doing it. The, the Constitution of Kansas, the Constitution of the United States is not suspended during this kind of an emergency. And, and there was a court that backed that up and said, no, really, you can't tell people they can't go to church. That is out of bounds. So just to follow up and clarify on the point about the legislature, you know, uh, 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 taking over some of those emergency management powers from the office of the governor, um, is, it, is it the case that, that, uh, that you think that um, we should revise and substantially look at the ways in which the legislature did that this year? Or, or what, is it what you're saying, that the pandemic has created uh, a new set of understandings about how emergency management should be either a shared power or something that has more immediate oversight from the legislature? Um, some clarification there? Well, I think there'll be some <clears throat> additional limitations put on power and likely more immediate oversight potential and legislative involvement in some of this. Uh, this is going to be worked out likely this session. I think we'll see a bill ultimately that looks at emergency powers and how we handle this kind of an event. But we've got some really fundamental issues to deal with that are a constitutional issue. We have to be in Topeka. We have to be in the Capitol building and voting to vote and pass laws in this state according to an opinion of the Attorney General. We certainly have to at least be in Topeka. That's the capital city, and, and that's what the Constitution tells us. We should revisit the Constitution and understand that with technology now, in a statewide crisis, uh, heaven forbid, should Shawnee County be shut down through some huge disaster and you can't possibly go there, we still need to be able to govern. So uh, an amendment that allows for during the declaration of an emergency, the legislature uh, to pass laws to govern how do you go ahead and remotely, uh, as we've been doing so much of our work, uh, conduct business and have it be valid mm -hmm. under an emergency circumstance. We should go to Topeka whenever we can, uh, probably not more than we need to, but uh, uh, we've got to be able to address these kinds of things because it's happened once, right? It's going to happen again. We, we just don't know when, mm -hmm. and we're not structured now legally to really deal very well with that, that piece of it. Just to reiterate, this is a call-in show, uh, so we can take your calls here. The phone number is 1-800-337-4788. What says you, Representative Rogers? Uh, grading the governor, grading the legislature, looking back, how was the performance in handling the pandemic? I think it's easy when you look back. You can uh, uh, probably have a lot more than when you're right in the middle of it. I can remember still clearly a year ago, uh, I'm not quite now, but in the coming days it will be a year, when we heard this was coming, what are we going to do about it, uh, decisions were made very hastily, um, we were told we needed to get some things in place um, and go home, you know. Uh, I think many of us were in the assumption this would only be a few weeks, like a typical situation. The uh, we are working on changing the Kansas Emergency Management Act when it comes to situations like the pandemic. Um, in the past, it's been for fires, floods, tornadoes, things like that. This is something completely different. Um, Just to clarify, what makes it different is the length of time. Is that what it is? Is that not necessarily yes and no? Mm -hmm. uh, a flood, fire, tornado would not affect the whole state, and so it, it's a whole different. It encompasses everything, everything this pandemic has. Now, like Representative Jennings, I will go start with the legislature and probably say, what have we done? Probably about a C, to be honest. Uh, should we have been in Topeka more than, 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 than not after March? Uh, safety issues, other concerns. Uh, we did some things remotely, but we can't do legislation without we're physically there. 
Uh, it took a lot of investment. It took a lot of uh, situations to get people there in January. Um, I think, um, you know, when you're in a situation where you're still learning and getting information every day, you, may, you have to make tough calls. Um, should we have stayed longer? Well, maybe. Don't know. So it's, 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 it's too late to kind of go about that. Did the governor overreact? Yes. You know, to give her a grade, probably a D. I wouldn't say it's been a complete failure. Uh, but the question is, why was Kansas shut down when New York was having massive outbreaks? We knew it was coming, but we shut schools down. We shut a lot of things down way early. There was very little communication between the governor's office and the legislative branch. So this, you know, this cavalier go it alone is what they complained about the last administration. Well, this administration was doing a lot of the same things. Now, people can blame and say, well, the, the governor uh, was a different party than the president, had nothing to do with it. There were things that were happening, and the governor should have reached out more to legislators or others to help in this process. To take care of people during a pandemic is not political. It's just the right thing to do. There are times to be political. When it's campaign season, you can be political and you can do that. But we're still in this situation to where there are so many, so many things because of those early reactions that, that we're still trying to build back. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, e it's easy maybe to say that now. At the time, what we wanted is we wanted Kansan safe. We wanted our fellow legislative colleagues to be safe because we were still learning. What we, what we knew at the time and were told, March, can, we continue to, and even to today, we continue to learn more. We're glad the folks are getting vaccines. We need a, a vigorous effort with all of us to make sure that, that the most vulnerable first are taken care of. Sure. And, and these aren't political. Yeah. Go, back, go back and check. Go back and check. Republicans have not made this a political issue. I, 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 I urge you to do that. Well, let's talk about the vaccines here in a moment. We've got a caller on line one. We've got Doug. Good evening, Doug. Uh, what is your question? You there, Doug? Yes, sir. I am. Uh, if, if you can speak, speak up, up a little bit, bit Doug, uh, we, we can't, can't quite hear you. Hear you. Can you hear me now? Uh, not, not very, very well. well. Turn that down. Can you hear me now? Uh, uh, just, just barely, barely Doug. Doug. Yes, sir. Uh, can't hear me? Just, no. Nope. Well, 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 yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yes, Mr. Rogers. You just talked about the most vulnerable. We, we got a son that's going through a mental crisis, and the revolving door here is just ridiculous. It's, there's no communication of, amongst anybody, and we're trying our best for this child. And we're not getting anywhere. I think mental health needs some attention. Your comments? Absolutely. Jay is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doug, I, 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 we appreciate your question. Thank you so much. He's talking about a revolving door uh, and some of the bureaucracies involved Absolutely. with mental health and access to mental health and the quality of mental health. Um, what says you, well, uh, Representative Rogers? Well, I, I agree. And, and we talk about vaccines, but, but mental health is one. And, and a lot of those situations have either been gone by the wayside or trying to find agency folks, a lot of agency folks are working from home and we do want to keep them safe. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to keep track of everybody. Um, uh, but it, for your particular situation, Jay, if it's okay, I'd like to give my cell phone number out. If you would like to call me at the end of the program, and, and it's no secret, I give my cell phone out to everybody. It's a 785-302-8456. If you would call after this program and share some of your concerns and, and, and the roadblocks you've had, 
I'll make that connection hopefully with somebody and get, because absolutely, if you're dealing with a mental situation, that is some of our most vulnerable Kansans. So thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Doug. Yep, thank you, Representative Ron. Just what, uh, any thoughts about that mental you know, health? Uh, um, Doug's not the only one in this boat with his family. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is partially as a consequence of, of the pandemic, uh, but uh, more importantly, uh, mental health challenges in the state uh, were being faced before the pandemic arrived. Uh, we've got a system of, of mental health that's uh, very dependent upon community mental health centers, uh, their ability to <clears throat> work with people on an outpatient basis. We have very limited capacity in our state psychiatric hospitals for those who, who can't access private care uh, in, in, in private psychiatric settings. Uh, we have uh, jails filled with people with mental health issues that can't get into the state hospitals for treatment uh, preceding uh, court hearings. Um, it's a huge issue, and it, it's largely a, a capacity issue that has been exacerbated. Now we have less people available to provide the treatment because of the virus, but we also have more people that need it. Uh, mental health uh, issues have been uh, escalating during this pandemic with anxiety and depression. Suicide rates are increasing. Uh, it is growing to be a crisis within a crisis. And we were close to the end of last session to really getting some reforms made, some more money put in, and, and we, we, we ran out of time. Went home. Yeah. We've got another caller here, Pam from Valley Center. Good evening, Pam. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and what, what is, is your question? The question? question is whether they support the governor's proposition. Can you hear us, Pam? Uh, okay, okay, we're going to go to a different caller here. here. We're going to go to Errol and Hayes. Errol, are you there? Good yes, evening. I am. And what, and what is, is your question? question? My question is that the governor has proposed taxing internet sales mm -hmm. like Etsy and Netflix. And apparently, from what I've read, the legislature is not in favor of that. I'd like to know why they're not in favor of taxing the internet, uh, because some Etsy people can buy products that probably could be bought locally, so our local merchants are losing out. Okay, okay well, well, great, great uh, direct, direct question. question. We're going to talk about taxes and spending uh, a little bit. Just, just to uh, throw out some numbers here from the uh, Kansas Speaks uh, survey, those in favor of higher taxes and spending, um, uh, not very large in the state, uh, but those in favor of, of higher taxes, uh, at, or keeping it the same is 50.1%. So in favor of either higher taxes or keeping it the same, 50.1%. And, and of those who favor higher taxes, 37.9% um, uh, favor increasing the sales tax from one degree or another. And there's been some talk about this, uh, helping small business owners from a tax of outside sales. Um, from what I understand, there is a tax in Kansas. You can buy things on Amazon. Um, but uh, what do you think about that? An increase in potential sales tax of outside businesses from the state. Representative Jennings, you first. Well, I, well, I'm not sure I understand the question. I heard you say increase sales tax, and that's different than increasing collection of current rate on sales tax. So I'm going to take the approach that we're talking about retail sales via the Internet for delivery of product to our homes. Mm -hmm. And that's called compensating use tax. It's not new. It's actually been in the law for some time. Uh, in the past, you were expected to declare this on your tax filing and pay it, and people don't. Uh, now, uh, the uh, Department of Revenue issued guidance to retailers on Internet sales that they had an obligation under the law, in their opinion, to go ahead and, and uh, collect that sales tax. They began doing that, and those tax revenues are, are going up. We have some work to do on this issue, uh, but it strikes me just fundamentally that it's not it's not good for local businesses if I can go buy something on the internet and avoid whatever the local tax rate is for that purchase versus going down to the local retailer and buying it from them and paying the tax. So yeah. it's, it's, a very, it's a huge disincentive to buy uh, within your own community. Yeah, on the one hand, I mean, Kansas has a fairly high sales tax uh, or a regressive one in the sense of it taxes food, it taxes clothing, but this compensating use tax 
is a, is a different kind of animal altogether, as Representative right. Jennings says. Your well, thoughts on that? Sure, thanks. Errol, thanks. I'm sorry I didn't email you back. He emailed me and uh, been a little busy down there. We'll talk hopefully with the reason why. Um, this is basically the Netflix tax, okay? Uh, we already collect a lot of sales tax. You buy something from Amazon, you'll pay sales tax on it. Now, if you buy, uh, order something from Amazon's uh, partner, that's not directly Amazon.com, you may not. One thing we've been working on the legislature, one thing that the governor did, as, as Representative Jennings said, is say, compel uh, those to, uh, to pay those taxes. Uh, honestly, the revenues came in a little stronger. I think the reason why you're seeing this in the news is uh, any sort of tax collection is to be viewed by some as a tax increase. And so uh, I, I don't know where it's going to go. I, I think part of the reason why is because of who it came from, uh, quite honestly. And, and I agree with you, Errol, that, uh, you know, the last thing anybody, I think, wants to do is hurt ma and pa businesses. And, uh, uh, but we also want to make sure that entrepreneurs uh, aren't, aren't harmed as well. Uh, so, uh, but, but really, when you look at it, it's, it's the electronic type situations and Netflix and, and the other things that, uh, that, that aren't right now and uh, could bring in some uh, significant amount of revenue or maybe not enough. And, and, and maybe uh, uh, folks are looking for a reprieve right now instead of, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, tax every, every living thing. And so I think, you know, uh, the days of Netflix, say, competing with a uh, local a family video store uh, aren't there right now. But uh, uh, th that's still, I think that's still a ways away. Uh, we've got another caller here. We now have Pam from Valley Center. I think she's back. Pam, are you there? Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening. I have a question for each, please. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask Representative Jennings about Senate Bill 367, I believe it is, on juvenile justice reform. Wichita Eagle had a story about it and the lack of of services for kids after they had been adjudicated or gotten in trouble with the uh, police, and they all end up in school the next day. So what's his perspective on that? And for Representative Raj is kind of a blend of the tax question and the, the need of services, the tension to have lower taxes, yet when there's a crisis, we don't seem to have the service infrastructure to serve things like mental health and up-to-date uh, system for the Department of Labor to be able to handle the number of of um, unemployment and the roads and all of that. So thank you for answering my questions. Great, Great questions, questions there, Pam. Thank you so much. Let's start with you, Representative Jennings. Right in your wheelhouse, your expertise, yeah. juvenile justice, well, issues, administration. Pam, thanks for the question. I read the same article uh, that you're referring to uh, from Wichita and, and the comments that were made there. Juvenile justice reform came in place about five years ago, and it was premised on uh, relying upon research to guide how we handle kids who become involved in the justice system. Uh, only those that are the most serious, chronic, and violent offenders should penetrate deeply in the system. The premise is the deeper in the system that they get, the more likely they are to be a, adult offenders at, a, at an older age, and residential placement at the time was not serving to really change behaviors. It was moving the problem from one community to another for a period of time, and then they'd go back to where they came from, and they were really no better for the experience. 367 took the savings from residential placement, put it into a fund, and began the process of developing community-based, family-oriented treatment regimes to try and change the behavior of the youth and strengthen families at the same time. Uh, that has been ongoing for some time. Uh, there's clearly still work that needs to be done. Uh, unfortunately, the governor would like to take $40 million of the savings that's been achieved and use that to balance the budget, will, which will further starve the juvenile justice system. But I would say to you, Pam, the same thing that I have told my friends from Wichita uh, in the legislature and the DA in, in Sedgwick County, tell us what you need. Tell us what programs are lacking. We'll work with the Department of Corrections. The funds are available, and we need to get those distributed to where they need to be to do what they're supposed to be doing, and that's not sitting in a bank account in Topeka collecting dust. Uh, and, and it's not just this administration. Uh, the rollout of this has been painfully slow, and it's time to get caught up. 
Uh, we're fortunate that our numbers in juvenile correctional facilities are down substantially from where they were. Parts of this system seems to be working well. Uh, there are some parts that are not, and hopefully we can uh, continue to focus on, on uh, getting that strengthened. Okay, great. Thank you, Representative Jennings. And uh, Representative Rogers, uh, Pam's question about taxes, classic tension between you know, the need for social services to take care of people and then fiscal responsibility, fiscal limitations here. Throw out again some more numbers. It's about 25% said that they prefer higher taxes and spending in the Kansas Speaks survey from 2020 of the Docking Institute. And of that group, 69% supported increasing state funding for K-12 education, public education, and 63.2% supported increased funding for social services. On the flip side, you've got about 47% of Kansans who want to lower taxes, one degree or another, want taxes to be lowered. But of that group, only 20% of that group said that they supported cutting funding for roads, highways, social services, K-12 education, Shows the tension right there in the numbers. What do you think, Representative Rogers? Well, I appreciate the phone call, and and it is. And, and I think if you've watched this program over the last several years that I've been on, I've always advocated for making wise investments in the state of Kansas, whether that be in infrastructure, whether that would be in social services, uh, uh, mental health. I mean, we've, we, we've fought, you know, and I'm a, I'm a strong supporter and have voted in support of of, of, of putting more money in the mental health and supporting our systems. Um, yes, and talk about labor, Department of Labor and the situation, the challenges. Um, but you do have, it is a fine balance. Uh, you know, we, we want a simple answer. Tax the rich. Are you who's rich? Somebody that makes a dollar more than, than me or you. I mean, that, that, that's the rich in our minds. And I don't mean to be that simplistic or that flippant, but that's, that's, that's what we run into. And, and you may say, well, I have no problem paying more taxes. Well, what about your neighbor? You just, you just mentioned this, the regressive tax that we have. We, we've been fighting the sales tax on food to reduce it. But in order to, you know, where, then where do those other services, you know, money for those other services come to? Uh, you know, and, and I want to talk about, you know, the situation with the Department of Labor. Not only with the, the, the fraudulent claims, but just the sheer volume of people calling. I, my phone, I get tons of phone calls. I, you know, that's probably the right word to use. It's many phone calls from constituents, text, emails, phone calls, day, you know, early in the morning, late at night, wanting to know why they can't get a hold of somebody. I understand. I understand that there's issues, and I understand we, it's easy to blame the last administration for what they did or didn't do. You know, if you, it depends how you ask those questions. I get asked the same questions by the same people come up with a different set of answers. I don't want to go down that rabbit trail, but this is what I'm going to tell you. We have a situation going on at the Department of Labor that needs to be handled. It's like my farmer friends know. If you've got a planter, a 12-row planter to get your corn in, and it breaks down, but you have an old 6-row planter in the shed, what do you do? You sit there and go, I can't plant corn this year because my planters broke down. No, you go and you get that 6-row planter and you work the problem. That's been the hardest thing. We've, they've thrown their hands up and say, well, we need this and we need that. And, and we have helped them get to that point. So how, what, how does that really answer the question? Well, what it does is, you know, things, there aren't simple answers to these. And simply to raise more taxes, because as we talk about the, the list, we started today in appropriations. We did 10 of the smaller budgets. And, you know, as we build the budget that will get, approved and then how we'll operate here and now and what is maybe a top priority for me may not be a top priority for Mr. Jennings or some other committee chair and as we go and as we and, and so what happens is we you know we, we almost have to pick uh, we, we not everybody can can win exactly what they want so it's have to be compromised has to be decisions <clears throat> well do we put off doing something or do we try to make those investments and that's where the Western Kansas delegation, I believe, continues to work hard to make sure that Western Kansas, you know, is taking is is slowly getting back to being taken care of when it comes to mental health issues and, and, and some of those others. Urban areas are very important, but if you have a situation like the guy that talked before, if he's in Goodland and the closest bed for the mental situation would be Kansas City, Kansas, that that that's a big ask. 
And so we should have those in Western Kansas. Mm -hmm. And again, we solve, we, we look at the problems and we try to work the problem. Mm -hmm. Messy legislative process. Uh, we've got another uh, uh, caller here this evening. This is Bill from Garden City. Uh, Bill, oh, good, good evening. You still, still there? there? And, and what, what is your question? question? I sure am. Uh, and thanks to uh, Ken and Russ for their uh, honest answers tonight. Uh, I have a very uh, specific question. Uh, it's come up that House Bill 2142 uh, has been proposed to possibly uh, allow application to counties for rebates by businesses that were ordered shut down by uh, the governor. Uh, I understand it will be heard in House Tax. I don't know if either of these gentlemen are on the House Tax Committee, but uh, for us counties, especially out here in the West, uh, uh, we, we couldn't sustain uh, the expense of trying to reimburse the business for being shut down by, by state government. So I just wonder if, uh, if either of the representatives are aware of that 2142 and, and what their thoughts are uh, regarding uh, that approach, Could, because it really seems flawed from a, uh, the perspective of a county, of a county commissioner. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Okay. okay, thank you, Bill, from Garden City. Uh, House Bill 2142, rebate for... Uh, businesses that have been shut down. Thoughts, Representative Jennings? Yeah, thank you, Doctor, and I appreciate the call. Good to hear your voice. Um, uh, this is an effort within the legislature to effectively um, fix a problem for uh, business owners who've been hit with you know, terrible outcomes and give them a little relief, uh, specifically related to the kind of the COVID thing. And, I, and what I would say is this, if the legislature wants to go ahead and pay the tax bill to the counties then instead of the taxpayer from the county, then let's go ahead and fund it and pay it. But to tell counties that their uh, revenue stream is going to be disrupted by the legislature, one, I question whether or not we have the authority to do that. But two, uh, we are a state that is absolutely deep in the belief that local control is important. And this is a, this is a step way too far in my mind. It's not that I don't honor the difficulty businesses are facing and that property tax is a bigger issue uh, than just this, but this, this can't happen. This, this is really the wrong way to handle it. Agreement there, Representative Rogers? You know, I don't tax anymore, but, but yeah, I, and I got another email from another Finley County Commissioner on this. Um, I think you did too. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I understand, and I think it's, uh, you know, as I tell folks, <clears throat> You know, if you want to know the real story, call your legislator. You, you, you read things or see things. or Just because a bill gets introduced, that's one of about 18 to 30 steps it needs to take. So because the bill's been introduced, the bill's had a hearing, you know, it's still got to go to the other side, and there's a lot of things going on. And I, 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 appreciate, I understand. I'm a small business owner, too. And so I get that, but I, I agree with Representative Jennings. Uh, I'm a firm believer in local control. Uh, many of us are in the legislature. Uh, we shouldn't be in the business of telling counties what to do. Okay, good question there. Uh, thank you. And um, let's uh, shift gears and go back to uh, COVID-19 briefly. But instead of looking backward, let's look in the present and into the future. Vaccinations, okay? Um, Kansas has been slow in rolling out the vaccine. Uh, a lot of states have been slow, uh, but it's been a struggle. Um, how can we improve distribution of vaccines to as many people as possible in as short a time as possible? Representative Jennings? Well, I, I mean, first you're dependent upon supply. There's plenty of demand. The, the issue is supply. So we only get so many doses every week, 45,000 or thereabouts, and it takes two rounds. So, you know, uh, you, you can only do uh, what you can do. 180,000 doses uh, a month um, would be too many, right? It's got to be 90,000 a month at that rate. And until there's more supply from um, the suppliers, that's, that's going to remain an issue. Um, and given more supply, if there is more supply, do you feel like the capacity is there logistically to, to distribute these and, and, uh, and to meet with, meet with demand? You know, that's a great question. I'm going to go right back to the local control thing. If you take 3,000 doses and you give it to the Kearney County Health Department and say, here you go. You know, or give us a plan. How will you do this? They'll manage it. They have the capacity to manage it. But there has been an ongoing, and this is a little bit of a look back and maybe counsel for a look forward, 
the lack of communication, it is not a surprise we have vaccinations that are available now. We knew many months ago that the target date was around the first of the year. And one would have thought there had been, would have been a great amount of time and detail going into the effort of how will this be distributed when it becomes available so that we can most expediently get it in the arms of people where it does good. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, so that's the quarterback, the, you know, the armchair quarterbacking on Monday. Yeah, maybe that should have been planned a little bit care more carefully. There will be plenty of lessons. But in the end, uh, get it, get it to communities, get the health departments involved. Uh, I understand soon the pharmacies are going to be involved and to the extent that they'll have, you know, availability. But demand way, way exceeds availability. And it's going to continue that way for a while. Yeah, let's talk about that. Doesn't get well. fixed in a hurry. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, Representative Rogers, thoughts? Um, what can we do? Uh, well, right. It, first off, I mean, thanks to the uh, county health officers, uh, the county health departments, first responders, all those that have that have done. I mean, they've done a tremendous job. So again, I know you want to look forward, but but we have we have to almost look back over the last year and what those folks have done mm -hmm. to get us to this point. There's a lot of discussion about a coordinated effort. And that coordinated effort comes from the second floor of the Capitol. I say no. I, 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 you know, there's maybe, you know, Dr. Norman, who's the head, Dr. Lee Norman, head of KDHE, uh, has done a pretty good job. Uh, I know some might argue, some might be throwing things at the TV right now. But I know he's been upset with some of the reporting and then some of the things that, that get out there as far as the numbers, so on and so forth. Um, do I think we're ready? I know President Biden one time said we're just going to do a great big dump and, and everybody's going to have this. I think we can be prepared. Uh, you know, our, our locals have that that capability, but they, again, have to know. And who knows better than what, what a local community needs than, than the folks that are there locally. Um, I, I wish there was a, a possibility. Uh, and again, some of this is liability issues where our county... Say if you're in the western part of the state, could our county health officers go to Topeka and pick up that vaccine? I sure hope they're a trusted person, and they go and take care. You know, uh, and they can get taken care of. They're doing the record keeping. They're, they're they're taking care of things. So I think that's that's where that rollout can happen. Uh, but every county's been a little bit different. In fact, I was talking today on the way out here with some folks about other counties. And okay, so I hear you know I, I hear this. Is this true? Well, no. It's it's a different way. You can go online, or you can do some other things, or you have to have an appointment. Uh, so it, it all, you know, every county is a little bit different. So you need to check with your county. But the, the bottom line is, um, you know, I, I wish there was a better plan. And, and I'm not going to play the blame game. A lot of people do that. Hey, you know what? Kind of everybody was learning as we go, so we do that. But now, but now it's here we are. We're here, mm -hmm. and 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 folks are wanting to get on with their lives. Getting that, you know, a lot of people right now are thinking that second vac vaccination and it's, you know, we're free, we're free birds. Well, we're not quite to that spot, but uh, there's so much information. So I would encourage folks, listen to your county health, listen to people. Don't just get it off the Internet because you'll be confused. You'll have 15 different masks on and do things that you probably don't need to be doing. Yeah, we should reiterate here at this point, public service message, reach out to your county health officials Make sure that you know what the process is for how to sign up and to get your name down and information down so that uh, you can get vaccinated. Uh, we all want to move on from this, of course. Uh, you know, uh, going back to, um, well, let's talk about the, the, the issue of, 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 of trust uh, and the safe and effectiveness of this vaccine. According to the Kansas Speak survey, again, from the fall of 2020 by the Docking Institute, 41.1% of respondents said that they would get vaccinated when the coronavirus vaccine became avail available, 41.1%. 28% said that they would not get vaccinated, and 31% said that they were not sure. Now, I kind of suspect those numbers might have changed since the fall of 2020, but those are alarming numbers. Uh, what do you say to that 28% who says they were not going to get vaccinated? And, uh, and what do you say, if differently, to that 31% who say they are not sure? Or, or more broadly, how do we encourage um, uh, uh, the public uh, to, to who, who may be skeptical that the vaccine is, is safe and effective. Uh, Representative Jennings? 
Well, I would just say um, safe at least for three days. I got my first shot three days ago. I'm thankful for that. I'm in that cohort of age and health condition that the last 10 months have been anxious. You don't want to get sick. Sure don't want to die from it. Too many people have. And people we know. As time's gone on, this started out as an abstract model with orbits way away from us. It was somebody you knew who knew somebody who knew somebody. And as time went on, it seemed as if it kept closing in tighter and tighter. And now it's names and people and faces that you know. Um, we, we have a duty to one another on this planet. And this is an extraordinary circumstance. And at some point in time, you got to trust somebody. Just like we're talking about government trust. This is health trust. It's science trust. I got it stuck in my arm because I trust that they're not going to kill me. I trust that Bill Gates has had nothing to do with the development of this and putting some kind of chip in my arm to track me around. They'd be bored to tears if they did. I would just say, think hard. Talk to trusted resources. Talk to people who are independent. Don't get your news off of Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, do a little research yourself. If you choose not to, just understand that the potential that you become deathly ill is real. And it may have an effect on your family and others. So I'd say step up and do it. There's a cohort of public that take no vaccinations, that don't want their children taking vaccinations. They have the potential for side effects, no question about it. Um, all of them do. Uh, and some people do have very bad side effects. But by and large, our system of vaccinations is safe. And we don't have some really bad disease because we've used them for decades. And the science of vaccinations are that those who are vaccinated protect those who are unvaccinated. It's a broader protection for society. Um, thoughts on, on, uh, on this issue? 31% well, said they're not sure. 28% said they're not going to get vaccinated. Only 41% say they will get it immediately. What are your thoughts? Well, I appreciate the question. I think, you know, with, as we... You know, from September to now, I'm sure the numbers have probably changed because we know more information. So to me, that's really, the numbers are, are, are a moot point. Um, I've been one, you know, I've had COVID. I had it in December. Well, it's not fun. Those who say you want to have it, well, I don't think you do. Uh, luckily, it was fairly mild. Um, and even at that time, and I represent Norton County. Norton County had a big outbreak in their home. Uh, the, the rest home, and as well as the prison, and demanding, folks demanding a mask mandate. Probably about half of those that did, half of those that didn't. I choose to wear a mask, uh, but I don't want to force you to wear one. It's, it's a matter of choice. Uh, I, I understand. I understand the other idea. Uh, you know, I, I do it out of respect for my family, my friends, my folks I'm around. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that's a, it's a personal choice. Uh, but I agree with Representative Jennings. I think uh, go to reliable sources to get your information. And, and uh, if you don't believe the CDC, well, then fine. But then talk to your local doctor. I would hope you go to a doctor. Uh, you know, I talk to my doctor about different things. And, and as we do follow up, and, and uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a situation that, that we're dealing with. It's, it's something we haven't dealt with. And, and, uh, but one thing I will say with this whole situation, whether it be vaccines or, or the COVID uh, the situation is, everybody's experience is going to be different. You can't just say, like, like the flu or, 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 or something else, say, well, this is, this is the experience you're going to have. My wife and I both had it. We had different experiences. So uh, it's, the situation like that is very tough to paint with a broad brush, you know, vaccine or not, because you have those that don't like vaccines, but want to get, I mean, it, there, there's, 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 we could talk you know, the rest of the week probably about this. Uh, yeah. And, and, and just to reiterate, you know, the importance and, and the danger associated with COVID-19, reach out to your county health officials for verified information, avoid information you might find on social media, not to say that there isn't accurate information on social media, but don't use it uh, as a reliable source. Reach out to your local health officials and figure out what the process is there. We've got a short period of time left in the show, but I do want to get to uh, a, a news-making proposal from the governor. Governor Laura Kelly uh, had a proposal to uh, link Medicaid expansion to the implementation of medical marijuana, and I want your thoughts on this. We've got the old war horse here, Medicaid expansion, which we've talked about 
uh, quite a bit on this show. And uh, uh, broad public support for Medicaid expansion, uh, a little over uh, two thirds of Kansans support Medicaid expansion. Um, what do you think about this linkage here? The linkage would be an implementation of medical marijuana in the state of Kansas, and the tax revenues for medical marijuana uh, would go toward covering the state's cost and obligation for Medicaid expansion. Um, what says you, uh, Representative Jennings? You've been on the show before. You've talked about your opinion on Medicaid expansion, but how about this linkage, and, and, and uh, can Medicaid expansion get done, linkage or no? I would describe this linkage as a strategic blunder. Linking these two issues together assures that likely neither of them survive. Medicaid expansion, in my view, is good for rural hospitals. It takes care of the unreimbursed uh, services for a good number. Small county hospital like Kearney County Hospital picks up a couple hundred thousand dollars a year because of it. It's a good deal. State pays 10%. We know the arguments about that. We know the House went through an extraordinary process a couple years ago, a year ago, uh, uh, to try and move it on, did move it on, uh, ultimately, uh, and uh, to linger in the Senate and die. Uh, medical marijuana is a very different deal. I, I take the position that marijuana is a Schedule I drug on the federal schedule of drugs. It's not allowed by federal law to be administered for medicinal purposes at all. We have states around the country who have chosen to go ahead and ignore that, and we have a federal government who has chosen not to enforce it and in fact has restricted the use of federal dollars for the purposes of enforcement. So it's tacit approval. Mm -hmm. I would say to Congress, either take it off the schedule or put it on the schedule and enforce it, but these kinds of actions by them send mixed messages that are not helpful to anyone. So and, you, and if they do away with it, then let's have the debate, but sure. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not inclined to have the debate because it's clearly a violation of federal law, period. And it's so that simple. just to reiterate, you're inclined to uh, support the federal government's position on marijuana as a Schedule One drug, not necessarily the public. Public in Kansas, fairly large numbers. In fact, surprisingly so, a larger number of respondents support recreational marijuana, not medical, 66.9%, a larger percentage than expanding Medicaid. Um, I was shocked to see that number myself. It will, in other words, can the public sway you on this? To be clear. Or is it I, going to be the federal government? To be clear, I did not say that I support the federal government's position on it being on Schedule 1. What I'm saying is it is on Schedule 1, and if it was taken off of Schedule 1 through the normal processes utilized by the FDA and, and all of the people who do the research to make a determination of, of safety of substances for human consumption, then we can have the debate. I'm just saying right now, it's a Schedule One drug. It's not allowed under federal law. And, we, and I come from a law enforcement and court background. Mm -hmm. It gets maybe a little hair splitting, but no. I mean, it's wrong to do that. It's just wrong to do that. And, and we send the wrong message when we say, well, yeah, we know there's a federal law that says, uh-uh-uh, but we choose to ignore it. So then how do we go to our citizenry and say, we want you to follow these laws. And they just say, uh-uh-uh, we choose not to follow that one because we don't want to. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. not a good scenario. It's mm -hmm. a very bad optic mm -hmm. in my mind. We've got about a minute and a half left here. Representative Rogers, your views on Medicaid expansion, well known. Linkage, I suspect you're not a big fan of the linkage here, medical marijuana and uh, let, Medicaid expansion. Yeah, Thoughts? Let, let, let's be clear. You call it a news event. It, it was a news event because it was a smoke screen. <laughs> that was when all this was blowing up about the Department of Labor and fraudulent claims and the 1099s that folks received. That's what, our, that's what this audience wants to know about. They want to be taken care of. We're not, Medicaid expansion, marijuana, medical marijuana, recreational, whatever, it's a non-issue. That's an app, those are non-issues. I know people want to keep bringing them up, but you, you, you can bring it up every week. It's not going to change. People want to be taken care of. We need to get the Department of Labor fixed. People need assistance, and we need this economy going, period. I know what the governor said, and she said, well, Republicans, they said, well, you know, guys like me, so you can't pay for it. This is a way to pay for it. You know, there's a whole lot in that bill that people have read in order to get those prescriptions written. And so we're, we're a long way away from it. But, yeah, it's, it's a bad 
to try to put those two together. It, it didn't win any points with those of us that can help move something forward. We've got a minute and a half response on that in terms of the labor issue in the 1099 forms. You want to add anything there, Representative? Yeah, James? I would just say to people that if you receive a, a 1099 form from the Department of Labor that indicates you have received unemployment benefits during the past year, but you have not, uh, there should be a number showing up on your screen. You can call that number Monday through Friday, 8 in the morning to 8 at nights. On weekends, I believe Saturday from 8 to noon. Uh, you need to resolve that. It, it is a report that goes to the federal government. The federal government will be expecting you to pay income tax on that. There is a way to have that removed from your records so you don't get into that, that problem. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Representative Jennings. And a lively session. We've covered a lot of different issues, lots of details, some good questions from the callers as well to open up this season's uh, of, of the Kansas legislature. Um, I'm Jay Steinmetz. I want to also just reiterate to you the idea, the uh, importance of uh, vaccinations, reaching out to your county health officials, um, uh, following the advice of your county uh, health professionals uh, in uh, dealing with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. That's all the time we have uh, on the show tonight. Uh, thank you, Representative Rogers, for coming on the show. Thank you, Representative Jennings, for coming on the show. And I am Professor Jay Steinmetz, Assistant Professor at Fort Hayes State University. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.